The final Chapter 10 module that we have for this course involves uh, the financial liability of bonds, the long-term liability bonds. Uh, bonds are a promise of corporation to repay uh, borrowed money at some point in the future, and they're generally issued uh, to finance a large project uh, that would require more cash inflow than a single lender can supply. Each bond represents a long-term interest-bearing note payable, and the purchasers of these bonds are called bondholders. These interest-bearing bonds are issued with a stated rate that's used to calculate the interest due to the bondholder. So they used to call these things, uh, they used to call the rate a coupon rate, because uh, back in the day when physical bonds were actually mailed to bondholders, there would be coupons attached to the bond that you would mail in to get your interest payment. So you'd actually kind of clip off the coupon, send it in to the company, and the company would return the uh, interest payment to you. Uh, now everything's kind of electronic, so you, they've kind of gotten away from actually coupons, but you'll see that term show up, what's the coupon rate on the bond, and that's what it refers to, is kind of back in the day when you used to have coupons that you would clip off to send in. Uh, interest on bonds can be quarterly, but uh, generally it's uh, semi-annual, so every six months. And bond prices, when you look at the Wall Street Journal and you go look at bond prices, they're quoted as a percentage of their face value, which is also a percentage of maturity value or par value. Normally bonds are issued in $1,000 denominations. So if you wanted to buy $10,000 worth of bonds from GM, you'd buy 10 $1,000 bonds from them. If a bond is selling for maturity value, then its quoted price equals $100. Or equals 100, I'm sorry. So you would see the quote of 100, that would mean, okay, it's selling at what its maturity value is. And so the maturity value or the par value is the amount the company issuing the bond has to pay back to redeem the bond at the date it matures. So the interesting thing is that there's a time lag between the date that a bond is approved by management and the board and the time it actually gets issued to bondholders. So the company decides here's how many bonds we're going to issue, here's the rate we're going to attach to these bonds, which is a stated rate that's sitting on the actual bond itself. You can't change that. And then time passes. And between the time that you decide to issue the bond and the time the bond actually gets issued, macroeconomic events can happen where interest rates change and also within your own company things can happen which make you more or less risky as a firm so when you decide to issue that bond it's got a stated interest rate associated with it and that stated interest rate is probably not going to be equal it's going to be close but it's probably not going to be equal to the risk that people uh, the discount rate that people want to lend you based on your risk so what ends up happening is oftentimes when the bond gets issued, it does not get issued at its par value. So if you're going to issue a $1,000 bond, a lot of times people don't pay you $1,000 for it. People will either pay you more than 1000 or less than 1000 because they'll look at those future cash flows that you've promised to pay based on the coupon rate, and they'll discount them back using whatever discount rate they think is appropriate for the level of risk that your firm has relative to another firm when it comes to like default risk. So for bonds, the, the major issue for bondholder is, am I going to get my money back? You know, I'm, I'm letting GE borrow a thousand bucks of my money. They've promised to pay me back a thousand dollars ten years from now, and they've promised to pay me interest payments throughout those ten years. If I'm pretty sure that they're going to be able to pay me back, I won't discount those cash flows as much as heavily. I won't build in a huge risk premium, and I'll I'll charge them a low interest rate essentially because it's a, it's a relatively risk-free uh, investment for me. But if it's a company that I think may be in danger of going out of business or is at least has a higher possibility of going out of business than another company in the same industry, I may attach a higher risk premium to those cash flows, which means that when I discount those cash flows back to the present value, uh, it's going to leave me paying less for the bond than, it's, than more than likely what its face value is. So that's the case in this one. Uh, this slide is talking about what about a discount on a bond. When a bond is issued at a discount, it means the bond was issued below face value. 
So if you open up that Wall Street Journal and you see that 98 instead of 100, then that means that bond's selling at a discount. This is going to occur when bondholders demand a higher rate of return than the stated rate on the bond. And it doesn't necessarily mean the company has gotten more risky. It could just mean that, relatively speaking, across the whole economy, uh, cash flows in the future, maybe we think there's going to be inflation. So I want my money now, I'm going to discount future cash flows more. So it might not have anything to do with the company becoming more risky. It could be macroeconomic shocks that cause the discount rate to change. Since you can't change the stated rate on the bond, the firm has to sell the bond at a discount or no one's going to buy it. So the issue in corporation records a smaller liability than the face value initially because you need assets to equal liabilities plus equity. And if you're only bringing in cash of 98 when you sold a bond that you were hoping to get 100 for, um, your liability starts out at 98. And then what we need to do is over the life of the bond, get that bond from whatever its issue price is to its maturity value, and you do that through an amortization schedule similar to what we saw in the previous module. So the cash receive, received in the case of a discount is actually less than the face value of the bond. So you were hoping to get $100 for the bond or $1,000 for the bond, but you're supposed to, you're trying to issue it at 100. If it ends up getting issued at 98, there's a 2% discount that you're offering to sell this bond to people. And you gotta make that 2% up over the life of the bond so that at the maturity, um, the face value equals the carrying value. You've actually increased the value of the bond up to its amount. Because the issuer is still on the hook for the face value at maturity. The other possibility is you could issue the bond at a premium. So it's the opposite of a discount. Uh, when, they, when the bond's issued at a premium, it means the bond was issued above face value. So if you open up the Wall Street Journal, you might see some bonds selling at 102. This occurs when bondholders are willing to accept a lower rate of return than what's stated on the bond. Since the stated rate again can't be changed, the firm sells the bond at a premium. So this could be that your firm becomes less risky or relatively less risky compared to other investments or other asset classes. If that's the case, people will assign less of a discount rate to those future cash flows, which increases the present value. And if you increase the present value, there's a possibility it'll increase above par. So what ends up happening is at issuance, you've received more cash, so your assets have gone up than what you thought you were going to receive, so you end up recording the liability above its face value. And then over the course of the bond's life, you get it from its face value down to par, or down to the maturity value. Because you are still, in either case, discount or premium, you're required to pay back the full face value at maturity. In this case, you're paying back less than what you borrowed, which is nice. In the case of a discount, you end up paying back more than what you borrowed. So here's an example. Wells Corporation issues a million dollars worth of 10% or 12% 20 year bonds payable on March 1st, 2009. So that's when they issued them, March 1st, 2009. Bonds are sold at face value. So this one's nice. There's no discount, no premium. At the issuance, you receive a million dollars, so your cash goes up, and you record a bond payable of a million dollars. To figure out the semi annual interest payments, you take a million dollars times 12% times 6 over 12, because semi annual means six months and you would get a $60,000 interest payment that you'd need to make on this bond every six months. So bond interest expense is debited for $60,000 and cash is credited for $60,000 when you make the payment on September 1st. Now what's going to happen next is between September and December 31st, you're going to accrue interest on this bond, but you're not going to have to pay it, that interest till March 1st next year. So what we're going to need to do is an adjusting entry at December 31st, of 2009 for $40,000 to accrue four months worth of the bond, uh, the interest on the bond. So you end up setting up a payable and interest expense. So we, we learned about adjusting entries in a prior module, but this is kind of like almost a flashback to that, that you know, because the cash flows are happening not at the end of the year, uh, you have to accrue the cost of, of the interest uh, as of 1231. And then when you make the payment on March 1st, you'd pay the $60,000, wipe out the payable, and record the additional $20,000 of expense because January and February have not been accrued yet in terms of uh, interest cost, at least not on the income statement. Um, and then on March 1st, uh, 2029, when the bond actually matures 20 years from now, you'll just get rid of the bond payable, 
and you'll pay back the million dollars cash. Now we said in a prior module, and it's true a lot of times when companies' bonds become mature, they'll end up replacing it with a new bond issuance. So maybe this company would go out and issue another million dollar bond so that they could pay off these bondholders with new bondholders. We've danced around the idea of present value and I've discussed that I've talked about it even though we haven't really explained it, but you know the idea of present value is that a dollar received today is worth more uh, than a dollar received in the future because you could take that dollar received today and invest it to earn some kind of return to grow to a larger amount in the future. You know, right now interest rates are relatively low, so you might not earn more than one percent, but still one percent's better than nothing. So you'd still rather take a dollar today, earn one percent on it, and have a dollar and one cent a year from now than waiting a year to receive a dollar. Um, and then the more you compound the, that interest, the more valuable it gets on a present value basis. So if you if you take the interest that you're receiving and compound it, you know, add it to the principal so that that also earns interest in the future, it grows even faster. So continuous compounding is, is the most advantageous thing you could possibly do if you're going to try to grow wealth. See if you can, every time a dollar comes in, add that to the principal. Every time you've earned a dollar, add that to the principal and let that start earning interest. But you know, generally people compound on monthly, quarterly, or annual basis. So that kind of like concludes the financial liability part of chapter 10. You know, in the first module we just discussed the difference between current and long-term liabilities. In the second module we talked about notes payable and how the amortization schedule would work with a, with a long-term uh, liability. And then in this module we've talked about bonds payable. And you would also use an amortization schedule to get rid of the discounted premium. Um, but so those are like the, the major financial liabilities that a company could participate in. The final part of this module we're going to talk about is loss contingencies. Um, so what ends up happening is, uh, if you think about the definition of a liability, um, liability is the probable economic, uh, future economic sacrifice. And so it's not that you're definitely going to have to have a future economic sacrifice, it's just that it's probably you have to have an economic future sacrifice. So how could that happen? Well, a good example of it is a lawsuit. Um, so if somebody slips and falls in your store at the end of December, then when you have to prepare your financial statements at the end of December to let people know what your liabilities are, you need to assess whether or not the fall that happened in December is going to give rise to a lawsuit. And if you think it's probable that it is going to give rise to a lawsuit, then you have to ask yourself, can I estimate it? And if you can answer that yes, it's probable and you have some estimate because maybe you've had prior people fall in your store and you know about how much it ends up costing, then you really should book that liability. It's a contingent liability because the lawsuit hasn't been filed yet. It's like a pending litigation. You know you're going to get a lawsuit, but it hasn't happened yet. But since the event that caused the liability has already occurred, uh, you don't want to misrepresent your financial situation. And the financial situation is that you have a liability that you've incurred at the end of the year um, due to the fact that someone fell in your store. So that's, that's a good example of a pending lawsuit. Again, like I mentioned, the, the two factors that affect loss contingencies is whether is you have to look and see what is the likelihood that this future event is going to happen and then can you actually estimate it. So in this case, you'd have to say, you know, do I think a lawsuit's going to get filed? And if so, you know, so if you can answer number one and say, yeah, it's probable that it's going to happen, can I estimate the amount? If so, you got to book the liability. And that's only if both criteria are met. So it has to be probable that it's been incurred and the amount of loss has to be reasonably estimated. If they're not met, then you just disclose them in the financial statements. So if you look at a company's financial statements, one of the interesting things to do is go look at their footnotes and they all have a contingency footnote. So if you look at a company like Apple, you know they might have a 15 page contingency footnote that tells you about all the lawsuits they're involved in, where all the people who are trying to sue them. And some of them they might think are probable, some of them they might think are frivolous and they'll like, you know, let you know which of those rose to the level of being probable and estimatable and those are reflected as liabilities on their balance sheet. So that's the, the extent of the chapter 10 material, understanding note payables, understanding bond payables. 
um, understanding the difference between current and long-term liabilities, and then this idea of loss contingencies as a, a kind of a, an interesting liability because it really is contingent on a future event. But because it's probable that it'll happen and you can reasonably estimate the amount, you do need to book those as liabilities when they occur.